TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. But by the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see it, little warning screen. I don't know what this video holds for us. But we're going to lock in, man. Don't forget, man, twitch.com is where you can catch the live streams, previous live streams, and things of that nature. Username is at the bottom of the screen. And we also got a Patreon where we post five days per week, man. Let's get into it, man. This is Narcotics Underworld. How Manchester's most feared crime lords lost their grip on power. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. The rise and fall of the Nonan family. Manchester's infamous crime the Nonan, the Nonan. It's a typical Manchester night. Alive, thrilling and bustling with energy. Okay. The city's nights are filled with laughter, drinks and narcotics. All thanks to the custodians of the club doors who ensure the narcotics keep coming in and the party goes on. Behind all of this merriment lies a dark world of violence, intimidation and power struggles. And the three custodians of these doors rule the world with an iron fist, quashing any competition before it rears its head. This is the empire of the Noonans, thriving but slowly and gradually moving towards its doom. Within 18 months, the empire built up with an ambition and ruthlessness that would come crashing down. What brought the downfall of this mighty Noonan empire? How did the Noonan brothers grasp the city's control by taking over the doors of its clubland? Join us to find the answers to these questions. Well, that was just the intro. And cover some more secrets of the Noonan clan. Who were the Noonan brothers? The three brothers worked together to maintain a tight grip on Manchester's underworld. Each brother had a distinct personality and role, making their criminal enterprise both robust and feared. Desmond Noonan, the enforcer of the family, an Irish Republican, anti-fascist, and a thug with a bear-like physique, Desmond, known as Desi, ensured they had a monopoly over the supply of bouncers at the club. Desi cherished his fearsome reputation, often boasting about the eliminations he was involved in and joking about witness intimidation. His confidence in his invincibility was evident. Desi frequently appeared in court, charged with violent offences, in 1995, he was sentenced to two years and nine months in jail for battering twin brothers outside a nightclub. But this was not his first encounter with the law. In May 1988, he was convicted of perverting the course of justice and wounding. He threatened prosecution witnesses and police officers. Imagine the audacity required to intimidate police officers without fear. Such was their power and confidence, they felt untouchable. Damien Noonan. In the words of journalist Donald McIntyre, Damon was the UN peacekeeper in gangland Manchester. Level-headed but powerful, Damon was dubbed the gangster of the gangsters by tabloids. As the leader of the family, he was a shrewd operator, making donations to various community causes to garner loyalty. His death in 2004 was a severe blow to the Noonan clan, marking the beginning of the end for their dominance in Manchester's underworld but that story is for the later part of the video. Dominic Noonan. Intelligent and cunning, Dominic was the brain of the family. However, the stories of his violent behaviour was enough to put others in their place. He kept having brushes with the law. In 2005, he was incarcerated for nine and a half years after a revolver and ammunition were found in his car after he was pulled over by the police. He was also responsible for mobilising the prisoners before the 1991 Strangeways riots. Oh, wow. In 2010, after getting freed on licence, 
He considered showing the world his other side. He claimed to have found God. In a bid to convince the court, he kissed the Bible while swearing the oath in his trial. However, with or without God in his life, he remained a scourge for the police. After getting released from prison, he started a number of dubious businesses. The thug even had a crack at stand-up comedy. Hi everyone, as you all know, I'm Dominic Noonan, the comedian around this area of Stockport. Nice to see you all tonight here in the Oak. So if you don't laugh at these jokes, I'll kill a lot of you. As none of you believe in this building. Yeah. As you know, just new to us, like, uh, just moved around. I seen a policeman the other day. So what's it like around here for crime? He went, well, we just arrested the six main ringleaders from Stockport. I said, where are they? He said, they're all on remand. I said, what were they up to? He said, what they were up to? They were selling drugs, beating people up, robbing houses, burgling cars and everything else. I said, where are they? Are they out on the streets? He said, no, they're on remand. There's two in Strangeways, there's two in Franklin, and the other two police officers in Wakefield. <laughs> Criminal who moonlights as a stand-up comedian? Now that's something you don't hear every day. The joke wasn't funny. But the threat was already there. <laughs> hey, do you? He relished teasing the police, a trait that brought him into the limelight in the later years of his criminal career. But that's a story for later. First, let's see the shenanigans he pulled to wind up the police. He even established a company called GMP, Greater Manchester Postal, after the police department's acronym GMP, Greater Manchester Police. <laughs> Since coming out of prison in 2002, after a 10-year stretch, he has styled himself a security expert and developed an unhealthy interest in uniforms, old police cars, security vans, and ambulances. Bro was one of the first trolls ever, huh? Despite his long criminal record, Dominic is taking advantage of his standing in the community and opening his own community police station, offering protection, security and banking services. Many locals have already signed up for Dominic's protection and financial services, much to the distress of Greater Manchester Police. He once changed his name to Dominic Latley Fotfoy, which stands for love all those who love you and f*** all those who f*** off you. This was his way of sticking to love you. And f all those who f I'm not gonna lie, that's pretty hard. That's that's pretty hard. Off you. This was his way of sticking it to authorities <laughs> when the judge and police had to use his name. His 2010 release didn't last long. He was recalled to prison immediately after he went berserk at a woman motorist who honked at him as he crossed the Gorton Road. He tapped the car with a copy of the Manchester Evening News, which featured the news of his release and shouted, Do you know who I am? The three gangster brothers remained in the limelight for decades. They were featured in newspapers, politicians' speeches, crime experts, and later in books and documentaries. How did the Noonans rise to power? The beginning of the Noonans was much like those of many family-based organised crime groups. They started off humble, struggling to make ends meet. A family of 14 children living in a decaying <sighs> city of Manchester during the 1970s and 80s. You get the picture. On top of that, they lived in one of the most deprived areas of Manchester, Moss Side. When there is well, poverty, there side. is crime. And these brothers found it as a means to get out of their disadvantageous position. Interestingly, each children's name begins with the letter D, which refers to Dublin and indicates the parents' Irish roots. They started with targeting security vans. They would jump at the vans while disguised with tights over their heads before violently pushing the drivers to the floor. The only thing left now was to ransack the van for cash and take it home. According to Marin Hardin, a former GMP officer, the Noonans were synonymous with violence. They had no fear of the authorities or prison. Dominic once jumped from a prison van at traffic lights in Pendleton, Salford, leaving the police baffled. Police <coughs> in Manchester say they're baffled by the apparent kidnapping of a remand prisoner. As John Molson reports, they're not sure whether he's been abducted or whether it was part of an elaborate escape. But wait, the most outrageous part is yet to come. Whilst on the run, Dominic committed another armed robbery showcasing their blatant disregard for the law. We had the uh, robbed the same day. One in the morning, around about 10 o'clock, one at four o'clock. 
He was going for the double, no one's ever done a double before. So we just thought we'll have a loss. Desi, the hitman and enforcer. Dominic, the charismatic but predatory and entrepreneur. And Danny, <coughs> the strategic head. Together, the three brothers took over the doors of Manchester's clubland and eventually... It was crazy, we only didn't went through one brother. He seemed like, that's a, that seemed like it's enough. One dude can run it the all. The reigns of Manchester's gangland. Bob Dunbar, who worked for Greater Manchester Police at the time, said it became almost legendary that if you went into a club, the brothers would be at the door. By controlling the club land doors, they forged a strong friendship with other infamous thugs at the time, like Paul, Paul Massey. Massey. The Noonan clan climbed to the top of this crime hierarchy and built a fortune. According to renowned investigative journalist Donald McIntyre, their entire gang was making five to six million pounds in cash from transit robberies at the time. They were skilled at their game, but savvy enough to seek less messy ways to amass wealth. The opportunities presented itself when Manchester became the party capital of Europe in the late 80s and early 90s. They took over the doors of the city's nightclubs. Now, why would this simple act entail loads of cash? <coughs> the answer lies in the economic transition of Manchester City. It had just emerged from the bottom of the economic depression. Narcotics had become the heartbeat of the city's booming nightlife. The nightclub's doors weren't just for party goers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoever controlled the door controlled the money. All they were the gates for narcotic suppliers who met the high demand for their products in the clubs. Control of the door meant control over who could sell narcotics, and in return for granting access, the brothers took a cut from the transactions. Right. Soon, places like the Hacienda, Manchester Dance Venue, a former warehouse on Whitworth Street, became their cash cow. If you think we're exaggerating, think again. They were raking. I don't. It makes sense. Taking in a whopping fifty thousand pounds a night, the controlling night? the doors and taking a cut from narcotic profits. After seizing control of Clubland stores, the brothers ruled the domain with an iron fist, ensuring no gang dared to challenge their juicy empire. Tremors in the empire. The Noonan's enterprise flourished for quite some time, but hit a significant bump with a fateful event, an elimination that almost closed the lid on their empire. In February 1991, leader of the Cheatham Hill gang, the flamboyant white Tony Johnson, was shot dead in a car park of a pub. Desi and Damien were on trial, along with three other men. Their conviction would have had a devastating blow to the gang, as it would have removed their enforcer and crucial member. However, the first trial collapsed amid rumours of jury tampering. The second trial saw Desi tried again, but ultimately acquitted him. Now, what caused Johnson's elimination? He was taken out after a dispute over the way proceeds worth £350,000 for a robbery were divided. Instead of ending the empire, the incidents caused it to thrive. With Desi acquitted and Johnson gone, Noonan's position became cemented further. By this time, the police were intensively surveilling them, but the Noonans seemed unfazed. They expanded their operations to other cities. Me yeah, the police could, apparently the police could survey them all they want. They did not care. Meanwhile, an attempt was made by another gang from South Manchester to take over the Hacienda doors. The Noonans quelled it brutally. Dominic went to the gang's pub and decapitated one of their dogs with a machete. Do Dominique, Dominique, you gotta chill. Like a dog as in a canine? Dominic went to the gang's pub and decapitated one of their dogs with a machete. He then placed her head on a pool table inside the pub, a clear message to avoid any thoughts of a takeover. The noon and rain, built on rob- that, that stopped it all in his footsteps. They was done at the weapons, narcotics, and a ruthless hold on nightclub doors would have kept growing had two dreadful incidents not shaken the empire again. First, Damon was killed in a motorcycle incident in 2003 uh during a holiday in the Dominican Republic. That's one thing I don't want to do. Go to anybody else's city or town and start riding motorcycles. Like, I don't know how traffic works in the UK, so I don't think I'd be out there riding motorcycles. The death in August 2003 in a motorcycle accident of their younger brother Damien, a gangland peacekeeper and enforcer, brought the family's respect and power to public attention. Ten police riot vans supervised the wake. 
100 policemen blocked the roads for the cortege. Dang. As mentioned earlier, he was the key to holding the clan together. His importance in the family is shown by the words inscribed on his headstone. Our family chain is broken. Nothing seems the same. Are you proud of your work with the Prison of Liberation Army? I was, yeah. I was made up. I like got our own back on them. A sense of justice. While the family was reeling from the loss, another tremor hit them. Desi was a volatile crack addict which brought his demise. While inebriated, he was stuck. Obviously, man, don't, you can't get involved in that hard of a drug and expect to remain anywhere near the top of your game. After death by a crack dealer in March 2005, dealer Yardy Derek McDuffus made headlines for eliminating the man who was so confident in his invincibility that he boasted to a TV crew that he had more weapons than the police while hinting he was behind 27 gangland hits. I've got a bigger army than the police. We've got more guns than the police, silly <laughs> bastards. I'm down to 20, 25 murders. Wow, a load of bollocks in it. 24, one of you No, I didn't do 24. And uh, what's going on? Now, why would a narcotic dealer well, take out this bold, buyer? He? Especially when that buyer is one of the most powerful thugs in the city. The actual reason remains a mystery to this day. Given that Desi was an unstable addict, his brothers had warned other dealers not to sell to him. However, McDuffus had refused to sell to him because he blamed Desi for the theft of some narcotics. They had arguments and exchanged threats where McDuffus said to Desi, F off, I'll kill you. After some time, Desi got around this ban by sending his friends to buy the narcotics from the dealer. But on the night of March the 18th, 2005, Desi couldn't find someone to buy narcotics for him. He'd just had a night full of drinking, dancing and karaoke at the park pub in Northern Moor. Inebriated, he knocked on McDuffus's door three times. The dealer came out at the third knock with a kitchen knife and attacked him, leaving the thug to die in the street. The dealer denied any involvement in the elimination or even the fact that he dealt narcotics. This was the last nail in the Noonan clan's coffin. The gang never attained even half of the power it enjoyed once. In fact, according to many, Damien's death was enough to set the sun on the gang's power. Paddy Doc. Yeah, man. If, if police don't take you out, or just like opposition, you're bound to make some stupid mistakes. You're bound to power trip. You're bound to get succumbed to vices that brought in on by the lifestyle, you know what I'm saying? Rockety, bare knuckle boxer, a friend of Damien and TV personality oh, said, Patty. the minute Damien died, they weren't half as powerful as they thought they were. Both Damien and Desi's were given funerals with all the pomp and circumstance of a gangland don. However, they weren't the funerals of the deceased, but of the power of their clan. It was their last hurrah in a way. The power recedes. Soon after his brother's death, Dominic, the last kingpin of the clan, was subjected to death hits. According to McIntyre, he was a man at sea. While grappling with the loss of his brothers and power, Dominic was also hiding a dark secret. The secret loomed large even when his brothers were alive, but disclosure of the secret sounded a death knell for what was left. What's, what secret this is? Left of his empire. While his power reduced drastically after his brother's death, he was still able to exert influence and command loyalty in the inner city areas. Wielding such clout, he became a street provocateur, troubling authorities and relishing in it. As mentioned earlier, Noonan was a scourge for the police. In 2011, he was recalled to prison again for being a ringleader during the horrendous Manchester riots. The infamous riots saw hundreds of youths in Manchester and Salford going on a looting and wrecking spree in August 2011. The chaos started after 29-year-old Mark Duggan was shot dead by police in North London and then it spread to other cities in England. The rioters looted the shops and set fire to them. The police also came under attack as turmoil erupted in Manchester's shopping districts. 
Well, the riots that have been going on uh, in the UK uh, for the last few days are well and truly spread outside of the capital now. Greater Manchester police say that this is the worst uh, kind of violence like this that they've seen in more than 30 years. Let me just take you through what we've witnessed uh, tonight. Uh, this started on the outskirts of the city uh, in the Salford area with looting. Uh, that meant the police then came in after that. Running battles then happened between uh, 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 the police and, and large groups of youths who then proceeded to force the police back, uh, smash their way into shops, set shops on fire. And we're talking about big shops here, uh, big department stores. And that then spread into the centre uh, of Manchester. Coming back to Dominic Noonan, he was caught on video talking to a pair of looters who were carrying a plasma screen TV. Hey, are you going on? You can see him walking up to the youngsters and talking to them. They appear to be at ease in his presence, which means they know him well. Notably, Noonan must have known the risk of getting caught in the middle of the riots. He was out of jail on licence and could be recalled at the slightest chance of committing a misdemeanour. But he liked playing cat and mouse with the police. Besides, Mark Duggan's death was personal for Dominic. He was Desmond's nephew. According to the Metropolitan Police, Duggan was a member of a feared gang, Tottenham Mandem, and was linked to gun crime and narcotic dealing. He was hit by... The fact that Duggan is connected to this is... <laughs> ...armed officers who were trying to arrest him on suspicion of planning an attack. However, Duggan's family denied that he was a gangster or possessed a weapon at the time. Two days after his death, protests at Tottenham Police Station ignited the spark, which turned into a full-fledged fire fanning out to other cities as well. While he enjoyed the tango with authorities, it wasn't much fun for them. Some prison governors outrightly expressed that they didn't want him, and they knew he would either cause trouble himself or incite others into doing so. At one point, he was kept in this special intervention unit, meant for troublesome prisoners at strange ways. He was released from prison on license in 2014. This time again, he didn't hesitate to cause trouble instantly. He brought Manchester City Centre to a halt by climbing the city's big wheel in protest at the latest efforts to recall him for violating his licence. This show created quite a stir, with over a thousand spectators gathered to watch. This pissed off civic and police leaders as roads were closed, buses were diverted and businesses closed. The drama continued for six hours with him hanging about 100 foot from the ground. It incurred an estimated loss of £10,000 in trade. He did have a reputation at the time, and some supporters amongst the spectators, but that didn't stop some people from calling him nonce. He was eventually taken down and charged with public nuisance. However, the judge tossed it away on the grounds that it was the wrong charge. He said it might have been only done because the offence carried a longer sentence than the alternative, i.e. aggravated trespass. The prosecutors didn't appeal the decision but it shows how desperate the police and prosecutors were to hammer Noonan if they could. His brushes with the law continued. I'm surprised they let that through there, the CPS or whatever they call it, let that through. For over a decade after his brother's death, with his secret hidden well. But what was this egregious secret? Dominic's dark secret. I've I, I got a feeling I know this secret. <laughs> Dominic Noonan was harbouring a sinister secret oh, that could sinister? end the road for him if revealed. He was suspected of being a predatory sex offender for decades by the police, fellow thugs and allegedly his own family. He was confident that the rumours that he abused boys would continue to be... Yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I, was, I was pretty right, I feel. I know it was like that one, but I knew it was something to do with me and rumours and nothing more. Or males. However, despite his influence as a provocateur, Dominic's troubles were far from over. He was jailed for 11 years in 2016 over arson, blackmail and perverting the course of justice. And then, only three years later, he finally was brought to justice for his hidden crime, i.e. abusing underage boys. While serving his sentence, he was brought back to court and charged with theft. He looked he do look the part of that. 18 historical sex offences against four underage boys in 2018. They were aged as young as 10. Given the gravity of the crime, Dominic wasn't pleading guilty to them. 
especially when he managed to ensure they weren't more than just rumours for a long time. The details of his crimes are going to disgust you. According to John Shearcamp, crime reporter at the Manchester Evening News, he revelled in a gangster reputation and used the notoriety to manipulate young men. The thug groomed and abused boys after getting them drunk. He had his first victim when he was 16, while the boy was just 10. He took him from a care home and assaulted him twice. After committing that horrible act, he ordered the boy to keep it a secret. The second victim told the court that he was 16 or 17 when he met Noonan outside a pizzeria. The thug threatened him, accusing him of having called him gay before he was beaten by a gang of teens with hockey sticks. He then indecently assaulted the boy on a few occasions, once in a disused shop. Nah, that's crazy. The third victim was in his early teens when he met Noonan in the 2000s. He was abused on 20 or more occasions. He told the court that he drove around with Noonan and other young lads. The thug took them to parties where there was drink and narcotics. He would ply them with drink, but avoid getting drunk himself. The victim said he was brainwashed into thinking the abuse was normal. The fourth victim was in his mid-teens when he met Noonan in the 2000s. He had asked the boy to renovate a pub for him. The victim seemed to be completely under the thug's spell. The thug denied the allegations, but was convicted of every one of them. His conviction included eight counts of indecent assault. He got life? One of attempted abuse, two of inciting a child into sexual activities, one of sexual assault, and one of engaging in sexual activity in the presence of a child. He was slapped with an additional 11 years for these offences, which will stop the child of sexual assault and one of engaging in sexual activity in the presence of a child. He was slapped with an additional 11 years for these offences, which will start after the completion. Yes. Oh, they don't run concurrent either, so he got 22 years? Yeah, that's pretty much a life sentence in the UK, right? ...of his first sentence. Dominic's woes weren't just limited to lengthy sentences. His reputation amongst fellow criminals was in tatters. Yeah, for sure. So he really had a 22-year sentence. It really felt like 42, probably. For a thug who commanded fear and loyalty in the underworld, being convicted of such egregious crimes was a huge blow. Sexual assault and abuse are abhorrent even by the underworld standards. What's more, he made these crimes really hard to be pinned on him. Dominic, not your ordinary crime boss. Gay, sneaky and a predator. The thug claims he's anti-racist and can speak Urdu, although only a few phrases. He had no qualms about publicly disclosing his orientation in a 2005 documentary about the brothers, a very British gangster. The Noonans in great gangster tradition. Yeah, like, after the Cray, twi after the Cray brothers, it was like, you could be, you could be whatever sexual preference you want to be. You know what I'm saying? What's the which Cray brother was it? Bro was a menace. He ain't give a he ain't care about nothing. He was top leader of gangster. Port the local boxing club. Violence, I mean. I've always thought, I hope you don't mind me asking you this, that um there's a hint of lavender about you, Dominic. Lavender? What makes you bring that because I've got a ball bed? That's a, that's a crazy way to put it. Well, you're a little lavender, ain't you? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Put it another way, you know, are you gay? Yeah, of course. That's funny. I'm sorry, that was hilarious. That's some gay, everyone knows I'm gay. Too bad. Well, everyone around me knows I'm gay. Yeah. However, his sinister side didn't come to the public's attention. I ain't never heard it worded like that. I didn't say, no, when I mentioned the Cray Brothers, I'm not talking about being, I'm not talking about the, uh, the uh, underage stuff. We're not, I wasn't even, did, never even said nothing about that. I was talking about being, I said your sexual orientation, being a gangster and being, have, being G-A-Y was made okay by them is what I'm saying. I ain't say nothing about. The other stuff, the other weird stuff he was doing. <laughs> I was talking about it, not something else. For a long time, 
Dominic managed to sweep his sexual offences under the rug for a long time. The police had now what he was doing was unacceptable. Had no trouble in finding evidence and locking him up for crimes like arson, blackmail, and possessing a weapon. He had spent most of his adult life behind bars, but proving he was a sex offender was an uphill battle. Not that there weren't any charges. Again. You're saying like men, but being an offender is crazy. Like that, nah, that, we don't. That's that's that ain't it. Against him for such crimes before 2018, he got out of a sexual abuse charge in 2010. Soon after, he was released from a long sentence on license. He was accused of sexually abusing a woman in a hotel room after celebrating his birthday. However, the case was dropped later by the prosecutors. Then, in 2013, he was cleared of child sexual abuse charges. He was accused of molesting a 15-year-old boy in a flat in Manchester city centre, but he was let go again. This time, man, they just letting this man go. His lawyer was getting him out. The court of it. was told that his accuser had a history of making false complaints. In 2016, he was declared not guilty of engaging in sexual activity in front of a minor. However, he was convicted of perverting the course of justice <coughs> by offering £5,000 to the boy's family in exchange for dropping the charges. This is one of the charges he was sentenced for in 2016. The dictum states, when there's smoke, there's fire. Dominic may keep denying the allegations, but the long-standing charges against him for such terrible crimes suggest otherwise. What do you think about this terrible revelation about the crime boss? That's outrageous even by underworld standards, yes. isn't it? The next generation. While Dominic was playing cat and mouse with authorities, the young Noonans were emerging as the next generation of criminals, although not as profound as their predecessors. Desmond James Noonan, Damien's son, had a brush with the law for carjacking. After serving an 18-month stretch, he engaged in another crime in 2012. His mother, Mandy Burgess, had won £1 million on the lottery. Oh. Desmond Jr. used his share of the winnings to bankroll a smack deal after splurging some on an Audi Q7 and a house in Worsley. While plotting smack, he didn't realise he was under police surveillance. He was arrested with his two friends moments after they collected 250 grams of the product. Oh. Noonan tried to escape but was detained by the police dog. The police also discovered a black carrier bag containing £15,000 worth of narcotics hidden under their car. Noonan was sentenced to five years in September 2013 after pleading guilty to possessing yeah, smack with intent to supply and possessing 20 grams of cannabis found at his home. However, apparently, there were some unselfish motives behind this nefarious deal. It was an attempt to help out a small-time dealer friend who was in debt to organised criminals in Salford. The man was facing heat from the gangsters after raiding their cannabis farm of 90 plants. He was attacked with a machete and ended up in hospital. Later, he was forced to run a new narcotic farm, but this wasn't the end of his troubles. The police confiscated the replacement crop after which he was forced to move to another place and start all over. But his creditors found him and asked for a repayment of the debt. He was forced to supply smack for them in his new town. In desperation, he approached his resourceful friend Noonan to bail him out. Noonan agreed to finance a lot deal, which would enable his friend to make money and reduce his debt. But regardless of the intentions, Noonan had committed a crime and had to face the consequences. He was ordered to pay back £131,361. What's more, Desmond's son wasn't the only one who followed in his father's footsteps. Dominic's son was jailed in 2014 for playing part in a £250,000 car ringing conspiracy. Well, to put it more accurately, he was held for bragging about his part in the conspiracy. Stephen Warburton, known Talking as Bugsy much. Noonan, was neither new to people nor the police. He had appeared in a couple of TV documentaries alongside his gangland father. Bugsy featured in a different kind of recording. He boasted of an Audi A6 he had stolen during a call to a friend serving time. Unfortunately for him, the police were listening to this. Why would you do that? That's stupid. Don't they listen to all prison calls? Conversation. The theft proved to be one of many targeting Cheshire's residents. He was sentenced to a 38 months at the age of 19. This wasn't his only crime. Warburton's offences originated from his connection to Withenshaw's Newell Street crew, 
who stole cars and keys from homes in Wilmslow, Lim and Hale between May and August 2013. He was linked to the thefts of two BMW 3 Series, an Audi A6, a Land Rover Freelander, an Audi A3 and a Skoda. Dominic fights back, but in vain. Dominic was still not letting it go without a fight. He appealed his sentence in 2021, oh, which was rejected by the Court of Appeal. Of course. That means he would spend most of his adult life in prison. Dominic's demise has finally closed the lid on the brutal side of the Noonan brothers, a destructive dynasty, the likes of which Magister is unlikely to see again. What does the future hold for Dominic once he's out of prison? Will he revert to the Old life age. of crime or have mended his ways? More importantly, even if he does go back to crime, will the new criminals deal with him after such heinous convictions? No! Noonan's versus the law. The Noonan brothers' saga illustrates the relentless cat and mouse game between organized crime and law enforcement. Operating with a blend of violence, strategic alliances and community influence, the Noonan's activities span narcotic trafficking, extortion and control over nightclub security. This diversification of illegal activities and the use of intimidation to maintain power remain the hallmarks of organized crime. It's crazy crime. how many, how many, like, <laughs> how many people were f aiming for the top in Manchester. The Noonans were not just feared, they were deeply entrenched in the socio-economic fabric of Manchester, manipulating both the underworld and certain legitimate enterprises to their advantage. Law enforcement agencies often face significant hurdles in tackling organised crime. The Noonans exemplified how criminals exploit legal loopholes, community loyalty and sophisticated networks to evade capture. Their ability to intimidate witnesses and leverage connections made it difficult for authorities to gather significant evidence for prosecution. Furthermore, the charismatic persona of Dominic Noonan, who garnered media attention and public fascination, complicated law enforcement efforts by creating a degree of public sympathy and notoriety. This public persona can serve as both a shield and a sword for criminals, allowing them to navigate legal scrutiny while maintaining their criminal operations. Despite their cunning and influence, the Noonan's criminal empire eventually crumbled. Desmond's they murder do. and Dominic's multiple convictions highlight a common trajectory in organized crime. While criminals may outmaneuver law enforcement for a time, Persistent efforts by authorities and the inherent volatility of criminal life often lead to their downfall. Effective policing strategies, such as targeted surveillance, intelligence gathering and cooperation with other agencies, eventually bring even the most elusive criminals to justice. The gradual erosion of their power base and the increasing sophistication of law enforcement techniques illustrates the eventual triumph of law and order. The story of the Noonan serves as a potential reminder that despite the temporary successes of the criminal enterprises, the persistence and evolving strategies of law enforcement can ultimately dismantle even the most formidable crime family. Yeah, let's keep it real, man. If you're a criminal and you're trying to grow and grow and grow in the world of criminality, you're going to get done for. There's no way you can peacefully grow. <laughs> Y'all, there's going to be surveillance, there's going to be somebody tricking, there's going to be, it's, it's too much going on nowadays.